Hi, everybody. It's Eric Murray from TheSugarHuddle.com. Well, this week, my college football picks were slightly better than they've been. I've been really terrible in recent weeks, uh, below 500, really struggling, losing a little bit of ground as far as these picks. This week, I was actually 500. I was 3-3, three and three, both against the spread. And as far as picking overall winners, as far as my pick six games, let me go on down the line and give you the scores of those games and how I fared in each one before we break down the games themselves. So Georgia, they won 36-17. I covered and won that game. I thought they would blow out Florida. It took a little while for them to really pull away, obviously, down the stretch when they pulled away. Penn State won 30-24 to over Iowa. I thought I would win the game, but Penn State was a six-point favorite, but with my adjusted line, six and a half, because I do the half points, so there's no ties. So actually, because of that adjusted line, I was able to cover by half point. So I did cover, but I did not uh, did not win that game. Houston, I did cover and win. They blew out South Florida 57 to 36, and South Florida is now uh, no longer undefeated. So at least four undefeateds uh, remaining in FBS FBS competition. Michigan State was the kind of the surprise upset that I had this week, and they ended up beating Purdue by a uh, field goal, or I'm sorry, by by 10, 23-13. And they were like a, a one, one, one and a half point favorite. So they were able, even if they wouldn't have scored that touchdown at the end, they still would have covered by a couple of points. And then Texas and Stanford, I lost them both. Though. Stanford lost by a field goal late. They they were like a two and a half point favorite. I thought they were going to upset Washington State at home. And then Texas, they went on the road to Oklahoma State. And I thought they were going to kill Oklahoma State, who's been struggling lately. Instead, Oklahoma got beat up for, or Texas, I'm sorry, Texas got beat up for a while. And Eventually, Texas rallied back, but they still lost by three, 38 to 35. So they're now no longer in the playoff uh, conversation. So we'll see what they do the rest of the year. Still have a chance to win the uh, the Big 12. But going down the line, you know, look at the Florida and, and Georgia game. Georgia got off to a pretty hot start. They were up 10 nothing early. Florida came right back, and Georgia did a real nice job before half. They put together a drive where Isaac Nada, the tight end who hadn't caught a pass all day, he made four catches in a row for 66 yards, and that got him in the field goal range. They could have even played for a touchdown. There were six seconds left, still had a timeout left. They decided to uh, go for the field goal, but or actually they had two timeouts left, and they decided to go for a field goal. They were like right around the five-yard line or something like that. That was a little questionable, so they were up 13, seven and a half. But second half, they just took over, and you know, Jake Fromm, 17 of 24, 240 yards, three touchdowns, no interceptions, 93.1 QBR. So definitely bounced back from the LSU game. Bye week definitely helped quite a bit. And he played really well because he's a guy that really likes to kind of throw along the sidelines. And he did a nice job, especially on the drive to Nada, of really kind of challenging the middle of the field more and challenging the Florida defensive backs. Florida has some pretty good DBs. So he had an excellent game. And then, of course, the combo of DeAndre Swift and Elijah Holyfield they combined for, where where is it? I got it written down. 175 combined yards. Swift had 104. And, you know, as far as Florida goes, you know, one of the concerns I had is that even though they came in the game averaging 34.4 points per game, they didn't really play like a team averaging that. They've gotten off to a lot of slow offensive starts the last few weeks, regardless of wins or losses. And this was yet another game. You know, they only had the seven points at halftime. And they didn't really play a whole heck of a lot better in the second half offensively. Felipe Franks, who, you know, in some ways has been putting together a real nice season. In other ways, is still another Florida quarterback in recent years where you're like, maybe he's just not the right guy for the job. He finished 13 to 21, 105 yards, touchdown and a pick. And there were times, there were situations where they did a little bit of wildcat action and, and tried to, you know, convert on short yardage plays in that way. So Florida, still some concerns there with Franks. Uh, their top receiver only had like 38 yards. No no player had more than three catches. They had three total turnovers. Um, so, you know, I said coming in that I thought this would kind of decide the SEC East. And now for Georgia, they have yet another SEC East type elimination game next week when they play Kentucky, who had that great comeback at the end against Missouri, controversial finish, but anyways, beat Missouri. So both teams are seven and one, five and one in the SEC play in SEC play, and that game is actually at Kentucky. But I, I still think Georgia is a much better team, and 
you know, here's Georgia all of a sudden they're in the driver's seat to uh, win the SEC East and possibly get to the playoff because, you know, the way you look at it is LSU and Alabama are about to play each other. Let's say Alabama dominates and beats LSU, then it could be a Alabama, L, uh, Alabama-Georgia SEC championship game, and then hypothetically Georgia could win that, and then you know Alabama would still get in because that would be their only loss, and they've been so good the rest of the year, hypothetically speaking, and could both meet the playoffs again. But overall, I was just really impressed by by Georgia in this one, and they just showed that they're clearly head and shoulders above Florida right now. They blew out Florida last year. Florida is obviously clearly a much better team this year, but nonetheless, I, I just thought that Jake Fromm was going to bounce back in a big way, and, and he did just that. So really impressive win for Georgia, and now another big game this week coming up, so we'll see how they how they fare. But uh, I still think they're the best team in the SEC East for sure. Penn State, Iowa, you know, like I said, I thought Iowa would win by a touchdown. They were uh, just a little bit under a touchdown underdog. They ended up losing by just under a touchdown, 30-24. to they actually got off to a quick 12 nothing start, and then Penn State was able to rally back. You know, what was interesting in this game is, I'm not a real huge believer in Trace McSorley, the Penn State quarterback, but I have to give him his credit because, you know, got off to a little bit of a slow start, also had a couple of drops along the way, and he gets banged up. It looked like he, he kind of banged up, like his knee or his, kind of his quad area, and anyways, so he was briefly out of the game for a little bit, and he was kind of hobbled, but... Came back in the game, and, you know, his numbers, once he came back, were pretty good. His overall numbers, he's only 11 to 25, 167 yards touchdown on a pick, but definitely played a lot better when he came back. And then on the ground, had a long touchdown run down the stretch, 12 carries, 63 yards. Miles Sanders had 12, uh, 17 for 62 himself. But I, I just thought he put on a really valiant effort. You know, he's always been a pretty tough player, scrappy player, undersized quarterback, obviously. And I was really impressed by the performance that he put on and, you know, now they're at Michigan next week, so another big game for Penn State, but they're still right there in the Big Ten East, and, and they could still, you know, possibly win the Big Ten East. It, it's still kind of up in the air, so definitely have to, to give McSorley a lot of credit for this one. I, I know the final numbers aren't going to be pretty, but overall performance was very impressive, especially coming back from injury. He actually played better after he got hurt, so be, it'll be interesting to see, you know, him going against Shea Patterson next week, Michigan quarterback who's very similar in style and, and not a whole lot, not not much bigger than uh, McSorley stature-wise. And as far as Iowa, you know, Nate Stanley, he's a guy that he's not like a top-flight NFL prospect next year in what's not supposed to be a very good draft as far as quarterbacks go, but still a guy who's definitely a prospect. He's like 6'4", 242. He's got a really big arm, nice-looking quarterback. He was having a really good year coming into this one. But he's 18 of 49, 205 yards and a couple picks. He had that interception near the goal line with a little over three minutes of play. It was first and goal, and, and he, he rushed it, and his tight end, Noah Fant, was the guy in the slot, and he didn't he, – he wasn't even, like, completely ready for the play, and he didn't turn around. Penn State picked it off, and that was big. And then final drive, Iowa still had a chance to drive downfield but couldn't get down there far enough. And, you know, Stanley, um, I, I just thought that – you know, he has a big arm, but the problem is he, he he still doesn't know how to put touch on the ball a lot of times, and there were a number of passes where he, he didn't put the air under it that he needed to, and he tried to fire it in there, and that led to some mistakes. And, you know, the thing is for Iowa's offense, McSorley, even though he played well, he also made some mistakes for Penn State, and, and he had a costly interception, and he had a uh, lost fumble. I think it would be charged to him because it was one of those ones where it's his own read, and he tried to pull the ball out, lost the fumble. So, that kind of is what kept Iowa in the game was their their defense and their special teams, but even that couldn't save them down the stretch. So Stanley really struggled. And remember, Iowa was kind of controlling their own destiny in the Big Ten West, and now they're in, in a tough spot because remember they, uh, you know, they're they're still dealing with the likes of Wisconsin and, and Northwestern. You know, they already lost to Wisconsin, and so anyways, they they. Uh, Northwestern controls their own destiny now in the Big Ten West is basically what I'm trying to say. Sorry for stumbling there. But anyway, so now they don't control their own destiny. You know, now we'll see what Northwestern is able to do the rest of the way down the stretch. But really kind of a, a tough loss for Iowa because they they felt like, okay, this, this was going to be a big win for us, a big statement, and had plenty of opportunities to win the game, but just kind of, 
you know, gave it away a little bit. And Houston and South Florida, you know, South Florida was 7-0 and coming in, and, and Houston at home, now they improved to 7-1. and uh, They're leading the uh, American uh, West Division. And Derek King, you know, he's, He's a guy that was a, a one-time receiver for Houston a few years ago. He's been the starting quarterback the last couple of years. Had a spectacular game. Seven total touchdowns, five touchdown passes, 419 yards. He also had 132 rushing yards and a couple other touchdowns. And, you know, kind of the main thing that I said coming into this game is I, I just didn't feel like, even though South Florida is a good team offensively, Houston's even better, and I just didn't think that South Florida on the road was going to be able to keep pace, and that's exactly what happened. I mean, Houston got up to a two touchdown lead and, and South Florida was able to cut it within seven a couple times, but it was just all Houston all day long. And you know, the impressive thing is defensively at Oliver, the defensive tackles, number two prospect in the NFL draft, he was out. He didn't even play this game. And yet, you know, on, on the ground, I mean, South Florida really didn't have a big day. They had a couple on, they had just over 200 rushing yards, but it, it wasn't enough. Jordan Cronkite, who I, I believe he was, I, I mentioned that he was third in the country coming in rushing wise. He had 20 carries for 73 yards, so he was shut down. They had a running back, Johnny Ford, who had over 100, but uh, you know he didn't do enough. And then Blake Barnett, you know, former Alabama quarterback, 26 of 39, 263, a touchdown pick. He had a decent day, but wasn't anything special. And I just didn't think he was going to be able to keep pace with De'Ara King, and especially with King, you know, a guy that with the run, rushing, the running ability. So overall, wasn't really too surprised that uh, Houston was able to get that win at home. And, you know, South Florida had so many close victories this year. They were bound to to lose eventually. But it's really kind of interesting now because, you know, you've got Houston controlling their own destiny in the American West. But in the American East, Central Florida, of course, has this big winning streak. They're still undefeated. But remember, they still have to play UCF on November 23rd, regular season finale. And that could be an East championship game, basically, to decide who goes to the American title game and uh, so you know as far as the group of five and, and who that group of five team will be that gets that automatic bid to a New Year's Six Bowl game it's still way up in the air with those three teams so it's gonna be very very interesting to see how that plays out very very fascinating for small school football and then Washington State Stanford Washington State wins 41-38 they improved to 7-1 and one. they're now all alone first place in the Pac-12 North yeah, I was really surprised because I really thought Stanford would, would get them at home. And you know, Washington State, it was such a big emotional win last week, beating Oregon. And remember, that's a game they almost blew. This week, it was the other way around. They were down 28-14 to 14 at the half, and they were able to really light it up in the second half. Gardner Minshew, who, remember, former East, East Carolina quarterback, who's had a heck of a year for Washington State, as graduate transfer, almost transferred to Alabama. He was 40 of 50, 438 yards and three touchdowns, but he, he completed his first 19 passes the second half, led that game-winning field goal drive. The uh, Washington State kicks field goal with 40, uh, a minute 25 left as a 42-yarder. Left a lot of time for Stanford, but Stanford wasn't able to uh, rally back and, and try to tie it or anything. Stanford at one point in the fourth quarter, they curiously went for it in fourth and three, and they didn't get it. They got stuffed, and that led to a, a Washington State touchdown drive. So a little bit of a curious decision there. Bryce Love still dealing with some injuries, six carries, 71 yards. K.J. Costello, I, I said he was going to have a heck of a game, and he did. 34-43, 323 yards, four touchdowns, did have a lost fumble, but at the end of the day, he can't play defense. And, you know, this isn't the same Stanford defense that we used to see, you know, up until two or three years ago. They've really struggled the last couple of years, and, I mean, that cost them. They they had Washington State right where they wanted them at halftime, and, you know, second half, they just couldn't get it done, so... You know, so be it. But, yeah, Washington State, all of a sudden, now they're a dark horse uh, playoff contender. I mean, I know they're not the sexy name brand that the, the CFB, you know, committee looks for. But, I mean, they're right there in the mix. So watch out for Washington State. They could be a surprise team down the stretch. And they could really create a little bit of chaos as far as the uh, committee. Because, remember, the committee, their their first rankings, their inaugural rankings of 2018 is, is going to be coming out here uh, on Tuesday. And then the one that I really missed on, a major swing and a miss on my part, was the Oklahoma State-Texas game. So I owe Oklahoma State an apology. I thought Texas was going to blow them out. I, I know the whole thing about Sam Ellinger, you know, was he going to play, wasn't he going to play with the injury? You know, I know it was Oklahoma State's homecoming, and Barry Sanders was there. They were celebrating the 1988 team. You know, had the awesome throwback jerseys, jerseys that they should wear all the time, by the way, Oklahoma State. 
But even with all that and being a, a primetime game, I, I still thought Texas was a much better team. Remember, Oklahoma State had lost three out of four after a three-no start. They were really struggling. Lost thirty-one to twelve to Kansas State recently. Yeah, they had a bye week, but I just I didn't think they were going to play this well. And, and the big thing was Mike Gundy decided to play more up tempo than usual. They're an up tempo team as is, as we all know, you know, air raid type of team. But they played a lot more up tempo in this one. They're up thirty-one fourteen at the half. You know, Tylen Wallace he had eight catches, one hundred sixty-seven yards, two touchdowns at the half. Had that big touchdown reception late in the first half on that jump ball on fourth and one, which is a, a ballsy call by Gundy and, and certainly a ballsy throw by Cornelius because it was basically just a jump ball in the end zone or near or just just shy of the end zone. And Wallace came down with it, did a great job timing his jump. Ended up with 10 catches, 222 yards, so didn't do a whole lot after halftime, but did what he needed to do in the first half. But, you know, Oklahoma State, they have kind of a, a history of – getting these leads on Texas and blowing it, and they almost did it again. You know, Sam Ellinger got a little bit banged up again this game, but he, he much like Mick Sorley, undersized quarterback, so much heart, very scrappy, and he did a great job in the second half. He got off to a slow start. He was like 5 of 15 passing in the first half. Then I think he was like 9 of 25, and then that's when he started to really go on a run, and it was really on a roll from there. And his final numbers, 22, 42, 283, and two touchdowns. 10 carries, 47 yards, a couple touchdowns. Had a, a real nice jump pass touchdown, but just wasn't quite enough. You know, you, you build that big of, of a deficit. And, you know, kind of similar to the Washington State-Oregon game. Washington State, the big lead at halftime. Then all of a sudden, Oregon goes on a big run, and the Washington State basically just needs one score mid to late fourth quarter to, to put it away, and that's exactly what happened. And, you know, I really I give Cornelius a lot of credit because he's been so – up and down, hit or miss this year, and, and he was amazing in this one. He had 321 yards, three scores, and on the ground had two rushing touchdowns. You know, did that zone read stuff where he pulls it out, keeps it himself, and, you know, had a, a, a touchdown run, very key run in the second half where he did that. And then he had the game stealing first down uh, inside, I think it was just outside a minute left, where he did the same exact play. So I was really impressed by him. You know, he's a big quarterback. I think he's like 6'6", 230, and, uh, Definitely has a lot of athleticism to him, and, and I was really impressed by his performance. So if he can play more like that on a consistent basis, then, you know, this team can really have a strong finish to the season. But overall, I was really impressed by Oklahoma State. Great job bouncing back. They're 5-3 and three now. Texas falls to 6-2, and two and, and they're out of the playoff picture. E- even coming into this game, a lot of people weren't really sure what to think of Texas. I still wasn't sold on Texas, even though I, I thought they were going to win this one big. But now you're just like, okay, well... Texas, you know, they really haven't, other than Oklahoma, they, they haven't had hardly any impressive wins. You know, TCU's 3-5 and five now, USC's 4-4, four and four, so those wins aren't really very impressive. And even this one would have been over Oklahoma State, who would have fallen to 4-4 four and four if Texas would have beaten them. So, you know, obviously they didn't. So, yeah, Texas, they're, they're a team that they still have a ways to go still flawed in the passing game and still flawed defensively because defensively, you know, they're going to be really great one week and then they're going to struggle the next. You know, Justice Hill for Oklahoma State at 92 of, of the team's 181 rushing yards. So, yeah, Texas defense really just couldn't do a whole lot right, and that's kind of their bread and butter right now because their offense still isn't quite on the same level as defense. But when defense plays like this, it's like, well, you're not going to win a whole lot of football games. So, you know, Oklahoma, they're they're – looks like Oklahoma is definitely the favorite, which I still thought they were coming into this game. Oklahoma is definitely a favorite to win the Big 12, and obviously they got a collision course coming up with West Virginia. But, uh, yeah, I, I wasn't a huge believer in Texas, even though I picked them, again, picked them to win this game big. But um, this kind of showed that Texas still was another year away from where they really need to be. So, anyhow, that that's how it ends for Texas. And then, finally, the Michigan State-Purdue game. Both teams were unranked coming in, and... But, you know, Purdue had just won four in a row coming into this game. Michigan State, though, at home, I just felt like they were going to bounce back this week, play a lot better than they did against Michigan, and I thought they were going to do a lot better offensively. Didn't realize that uh, Brian Lewerke was banged up coming into this game, and he didn't play. Freshman Rocky Long, who looks like Sunshine from Remember the Titans, if you remember that movie, he's a good-sized quarterback, 6'3", about 220, true freshman. out of He's from the state of Iowa, and he did a heck of a job. You know, he... he showed some athleticism and, and made some really nice throws and he was really on it all day long he finished 26 of 46 318 yards and a couple touchdowns 
And, you know, Michigan State was just a slightly better team all day. It was a back-and-forth game, low-scoring game, but they were just a little bit of a better team all day long. And, you know, I, I thought the main thing with Purdue is they were going to have a hangover because it was such a big emotional win at home against Ohio State, all the implications. And I just thought they were going to go noon game, East Lansing, and they were going to sleepwalk a little bit. And, and Jeff Brom, who I still want USC to hire as their next head coach, he he was chewing out a lot of people on the sidelines, and I don't blame him. And, I mean, you know, David Blau, after such a great game a week ago against Ohio State, hell of an effort, had three touchdown passes, I believe. He had three interceptions in this one, no touchdowns, was 29 of 49. He's really struggled all day long, was really off on a lot of plays. You know, one of the interceptions was late to seal the game when they were already down by 10. DJ Knox, who had a, a tremendous game a week ago against Ohio State, he had just seven carries in this one big for 51 yards as a team they only had 62 yards so did nothing on the ground after tearing it up against Ohio State passing game too many turnovers too many mistakes they snapped a four game winning streak they're now uh, second in the west but they host Iowa next week so that'll be an elimination game in the west so it's interesting because they could still go get to the Big Ten championship game even with this loss but you do wonder I mean how good is this Purdue team you know even though they won four in a row they're only real important win was against Ohio State and you know you just wonder uh, can they find a way to win the Big Ten West because I don't see Northwestern winning out Iowa could you know Iowa's a beatable team coming off of a rough week so it's gonna be very interesting to see what happens there but anyways nice win for Michigan State great great win for Oklahoma State definitely the most impressive team of the weekend Houston's looking good Georgia you know I wasn't surprised by that one you know, give Penn State some credit for, for getting that win. But um, anyways, those that kind of concludes my Week 9 college football pick 6, how my picks fared. So I, I'm going to also do some bowl picks after the regular season ends, just to let you know. So we'll see what my record ends up being because I'm still slightly under 500 right now. But for the time being, we'll worry about the regular season. So anyways, that's my pick 6. And please go to SugarHoddle.com. As always, please uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. And please like my Facebook page, which is just called The Sugar Huddle as well. And spread the word. Thank you.